Morning, it's Christo here on Talk. Thanks so much for your company this morning. Many stories you're waking up to on this Sunday morning. Some good, some bad, some ugly. Uh, quite a few ugly for the government, actually. We've been talking about this potential hypocrisy. That's what the Mail on Sunday are calling it over. Liz Kendall, um, the uh, government minister overseeing the winter fuel payment being axed, though herself claiming over £3,800 in winter fuel expenses uh, as part of the second home expenses she gets as an MP. And uh, she did that over 15 months. And whether that is um, absolute hypocrisy. Uh, we've been talking as well about Elon Musk potentially giving Nigel Farage a hundred million dollars to make him prime minister. Uh, we've also as well been uh, discussing why Labour seem to have so little confidence from the business community. Well, to discuss those stories and a few others as well. Uh, let's talk to the political correspondent at The Spectator, James Heal, who joins us live this morning here on Talk. Morning to you, James. Morning, Christine. So, uh, is this hypocrisy? from Liz Kendall. Is this something that could have been predicted? And is this just perhaps the system that we live in? And although it's bad optics, um, mm. she's not been a personal hypocrite. Is the mail on Sunday making a mountain out of a molehill here? Well, it's never something I could accuse the mail on Sunday of. Uh, I think, look, it's certainly bad politics. I think this was very much foreseeable. Um, I think clearly that this is the reason why we've not had any minister go near this for decades now. You know, there's a reason why it was set up almost 30 years ago. There's a reason why no minister has touched it since, because frankly, it's not worth the political headache of taking this away, not least, of course, because you open yourself up to allegations of hypocrisy. And also, you don't save that much money, because now ministers have this complete sham, this charade, where they're saying, please go and claim uh, fuel credit elsewhere, sort of pension credit elsewhere. Uh, and of course, they don't want them to do that. They want to make the savings. They want to save the 1.3 billion, or whatever it is projected to. But actually, of course, with this big public campaign, they're not going to save much money. And they now open themselves up to personal attacks, like we've seen in the mail today. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's, as I was saying before, this policy, I understand the logic of saying, look, some people are wealthy and perhaps don't need the payment so much. But I, I, my fear is they're trying to make perfect the enemy of good. And there are lots of policies that, that, that aren't perfect on paper. But you know what? I have no problem with someone who is perhaps wealthy, who's paid into the system all their life getting the winter fuel payment if it means that it goes to the people that really need it especially when you look at the number of of donations to charities which have now incidentally gone down from pensioners who actually end up donating their winter fuel payment those pensioners that don't need it yeah i think that line there about you know perfect enemy of the good is spot on and you see this as well repeatedly across different policies so the farming tax is another perfect example of that, which is that, yes, there is a minority of people who buy land in this country to maximise value, to minimise tax payments, etc. Equally, does that mean we should penalise family farmers who find, you know, farm that land for many, many years, often at not much money themselves? These are the different issues we should be exploring here. Uh, and again, I have to say that I think that the danger is, Christo, is that a lot of this comes from the inexperience and novelty of the new Labour ministers, which they came in, they got presented with Trevor Trudy, civil servants, giving them ideas. They said, look, we should do this, we should do that. I said, oh, we'll grab that as a good way of gaining the of money. And of course, actually, the reason why they know it's been done is because there are very, very good arguments against it, which is if you're going to raise money, why not actually do a big blockbuster measure, a bit like the national insurance, 25 billion there, rather than sort of rummaging around, irritating these sort of communities, and as you say, making the perfect enemy of the good. Uh, okay, just uh, pausing for a second, I just want to bring you some breaking news. Greg Wallace mm. has um, said that accusations against him come from middle-class women of a certain age. He said this in the release of an Instagram uh, video. We're going to bring that to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in, this, uh, in these videos in just a few minutes time. He says that he's worked with more than 4,000 contestants uh, over the years of all different ages, backgrounds and walks of life and apparently there's 13 complaints in that time and uh, it's a handful of middle class women of a certain age um, just from Celebrity Masterchef. This isn't right. So um, we'll bring you that video and of course get your reaction in a few minutes time. Okay, another big story this morning which um, isn't the front page of the Sunday Times. They've still gone for the assisted dying bill and some of the controversy around that. Maybe we'll touch on that in just a moment. But they are talking about this um, donation, apparently, that is being mooted from 
Elon Musk, which could be what they're calling an FU to Starman. I can't possibly imagine what that would mean. Uh, $100 million, £76 million to the Reform Party in order to boost the chances of Nigel Farage actually becoming Prime Minister or indeed, I suppose, a coalition might be on the cards with the Conservatives uh, for the next election. Um, firstly, how likely is that? Why would Elon Musk do it? What's your reaction to it? Well, I'm still a little bit sceptical. I think that, you know, this is based on speculative reports right now, which in the sense he might do this, he might do that. I, I, to be honest, I'm not up on the raw around sort of foreign donors giving this kind of level of donations. I'd, I'd be sceptical it'd be that high, not least, of course, because there's spending caps. And I think most UK elections typically have about sort of 40 million spent on them in the short campaign. Well, so I think just, just to jump in, they're talking about it potentially being through the UK branch of X, meaning that yeah. it would get around those foreign donation rules. But, but I don't know whether there are other rules it might break no no, no I, I think you're probably, you're probably that's probably the sensible way to do it. i mean there are ways of doing these things right but i mean I, look i think that you know with at Mar-a-Lago two weeks ago, Nigel Farage and Elon Musk met for the first time. My understanding is that they were there just after the election night party, and Donald Trump was talking to Farage and uh, brought them all over, and they had a sort of met, got together, etc., and they had a long conversation talking together. And I think that there's, you know, it's clearly Farage is the only MP that Musk follows on Twitter X. Uh, Farage is someone who is very happy to boost. He's often going on in the small hours of the morning in America, and of course, the only speaking English-speaking world up at that time is the UK. So he's happy to kind of like and retweet, etc stuff etc uh, i think it's a long shot i think there are other things to do other than than just cash in hand donations etc i think you can play around with algorithms i think you can do big support big rallies etc so i would make to see but i think this is another step on the road towards a kind of more formal uh, reform uh, trump kind of alliance so i think i'm very excited to see what happens very interested to see what happens and um you know critics of musk will just say look this is another example of why this man cannot wield such influence and power in our system yes but now what's interesting is if if the Labour Party or Keir Starmer moves to do anything about it, it's going to look like massive sour grapes against the mm. fact that Elon Musk clearly doesn't support him. And, I mean, knowing the size of Keir Starmer's ego, this is going to be really unpleasant reading for him this morning, isn't it? Oh, it certainly will. Um, I mean, you know, I shot into one Labour MP a couple of weeks ago and he said to me that, um, you know, Wilson didn't have to deal with this. Atlee didn't have to deal with this. How on earth do you deal with the world's richest man owning such a powerful, influential news site, which is what it X is? And they haven't found an answer to it. Initially, over the summer, you saw quite a bullish response from number 10. Now you see a kind of ignore, don't engage, the sort of Tinkerbell strategy, don't give it oxygen and it'll die. They haven't worked out how to deal with him. And how do you solve a problem like Elon Musk? If you know the answer, should they, should they have schmoozed him? Because a lot of people were surprised when they held that big business summit where they were inviting business leaders yeah. from 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 right left and center I mean, literally right left and center they didn't they didn't invite elon musk i think there's a strong argument to schmooze him which is that musk has such influence and power that he often is important in different ways so ukraine for instance ukraine uh, is something that starman's put a huge amount of political capital in he's got the starlink uh website that it sort of access etc and that starlink is really important for kind of ukraine's online digital system. So I think that very much he ought to have been sort of schmoozed in a way of kind of keeping him on Ukraine's side rather than sort of tweeting some of the stuff he's been tweeting recently. Also, of course, he went to uh, Bletchley Park last year and met with Rishi Sunak. So I think he is an anglophile, very much interested in, in the UK. And I, I disagree with a lot of his political views, but I do think that there's a strong case to kind of keep him on side and, you know, better the devil, you know, rather than get him out in the enemy's hands. Well, yeah, because politics, part of politics is is smiling and waving. I think this is really demonstrative of the the transition issues that Labour have faced from being these almost activists on the sidelines and, you know, getting in a huff and folding their arms and digging their heels in and mm -hmm. saying... And, and then realising that actually in government you can't do that as easily. You need to actually do a bit of smiling and waving. You need to do a bit of schmoozing, even though you might find people unpleasant. And they face that with Trump when you actually compare what they've said in opposition to now what they're having to do in practice. And I think that this is the same issue with Elon Musk. You're spot on. And I think that this is what they're trying to learn, is that, you know, you can replace a blue rosette with a red rosette, but it doesn't mean that your interests and values as a country change dramatically. The fact is the UK needs to work with the USA and its key tech players. Elon Musk may be someone who's more vocal end of that, but the reality is he is the embodiment of what 
you know, Labour needs to get its head around, which is that you can't choose the people who are dealing in positions of power, particularly, of course, when the most powerful man in the world is Donald Trump, and this is his big ally in Silicon Valley. Uh, OK, um, another story as well I just want to get your opinion on this morning, and that is these business leaders that are saying that their confidence in Labour is as low, or if not lower, than at the start of the pandemic. Of course, you know, one of the biggest catastrophes to face businesses in history. This is 600 prominent business leaders. This comes shortly after, of course, a few weeks ago when we heard just before the budget, the consumer confidence was at an all-time low. Mm. Now, again, if you're a government that has said, look, we want to put growth, business confidence at the absolute core of, of what it is we stand for, this is disastrous reading, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think Labour is caught between a sort of policy game and a political game. The political game, of course, is pin the blame on the Tories, this fiscal black hole narrative. The danger is, of course, is you undermine consumer confidence in the UK, business confidence in the UK. And you're seeing this right now in a whole string of different surveys. There was the private, um, the, the PMI index that came out last week as well. You've seen this in the IOD forecast for this year. And of course, this is contributing to a sense of, you know, business apathy with the UK. At the same time, ministers are going out there begging places like Shine to list on the UK Stock Exchange. And really, I think the government needs to get its head around, again, as you say, Krista, about making that transition from opposition to power. And when you're in government, what you say matters. If you constantly talk down the UK, that has an impact on what businesses are doing in terms of investing their money in UK PLC. Uh, and uh, that I, is the thing I find the most staggering, actually. I understand that when you've got a budget on the horizon, that you... You know, you maybe need to hint about a little of what's in it, but for four months, all we heard was how catastrophic things are and were going to be. And it seems such... I mean, it's so obvious that everyone would say, well, hang on, I'm not going to spend anything, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to wait and see. And then when the budget comes and it is catastrophic, of course businesses and consumers are going to find that difficult. Of course. Of course, and it's you know reveal pre reveal preference versus stated preference, which is that you know when you go into government, you know Labour said all these nice things about business, and of course they then do the national insurance hike. Uh, they do a whole bunch of things which they realise you know are not appreciative of what the business sector is going through right now in terms of regulation, etc. And I think the Tories are certainly going to be very much pushing this line that says, look, you know Labour they have an entire cabinet, very few of whom, any of whom have been in business in the private sector, and I think this is going to be an attack line that keeps coming up again and again and again. You know the stick of business is going to be used to bash Labour. And for the Tories who need to rebuild their credibility after failing in this area miserably, it's going to be a very useful stick to keep attacking the Labour Party with. Really interesting to get your uh, views on some of those big stories this morning. Political correspondent at The Spectator, James Heal, thanks for joining us. Now, uh, as I said to you a few moments ago, Greg Wallace uh, facing um, more of these allegations in the last 24 hours of this inappropriate behaviour, some saying now physical inappropriateness when it comes to uh, touching of some of the celebrities on MasterChef and some of the other shows that he has presented on. Allegations this morning that the BBC were warned many years ago about some of his actions. Well, he's now released an Instagram video, Greg Wallace, responding to allegations uh, that you've been hearing. Now, I've been doing MasterChef for 20 years. Amateur, celebrity and professional MasterChef. And I think in that time, I have worked with over 4,000 contestants of all different ages, all different backgrounds, all walks of life. And apparently now, I'm reading in the paper, there's been 13 complaints in that time. Now, in the newspaper, I can see the complaints coming from a handful of middle class women of a certain age, just from Celebrity MasterChef. This isn't right. Middle class women of a certain age. He also goes on in a second video, by the way, uh, to say that in 20 years, over 20 years of television, can you imagine how many women female contestants on MasterChef have made sexual remarks or sexual innuendo, can you imagine? 